I'm going to tell you what it's about, but first, Apple, peanut butter, art magazine that I use as a journal, long list of random associations, tote bag, trucker hat, water bottle from the lost and found box, laptop, laptop cover, black stooly thing we found somewhere in the theater, 46-year-old body with some scar tissue. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you some of my patterns. I didn't want to make a solo, but then I decided to. There was an application and an invitation, and like any artist who had a moment of feeling wanted, I decided I should go for it. I could stop subjecting my underpaid collaborator friends to my ever-changing, but not really ever-changing ideas, and instead make myself responsible. But then the problem of a more obvious narcissism and all the other visible problems like Another white woman doing a mashup of contemporary forms, exploring something kind of hard to pin down, might have something to do with witchcraft, and looking for a particular kind of attention. Which is funny to think about the kinds of attention that are available under the conditions of performance, that we think we can see some things and not other things, when in fact, we can see everything. But just because the room is a different size box and the lights are in different places, we decide what's important to focus on, like, how much money trained this body. <laughs> I thought it would make something about something or find something to remake in order to have something to be about. A famous play, a Broadway musical, an IRL event, or a personal story like, I'm on my knees in the dirt, the road to my parents' house is behind me, and every now and then a car drives past. I have a recently eaten salad from Panera Bread in my stomach from having dinner with my dad. When we got done eating, we rode back to their house in silence. And when we got to the driveway, I got out of the car and I started walking. I had the same tote bag. I'm not sure why I brought it. I didn't need it, but I didn't know what else to do with it. The sun was setting on this particular housing development from the late 1990s kind of reminiscent of the TV show Dawson's Creek. The house across the street from my parents' house used to not exist. No one is outside, and I feel entirely exposed. A strange woman walking through a suburban neighborhood with a tote bag, and not a dog, and not a husband and kids, and not even yoga pants, running shoes, or an Apple Watch. <laughs> when I'm on my knees, I'm on a road I've been on dozens of times as a teenager. We would carry beer and drugs out into the Yakima River Delta, not quite as afraid of being sprayed by a skunk or caught by the cops as we should have been. We would talk too loud, build an obvious fire, and then cross water on downed trees with a four-hour buzz going. Our cars would line up in the parking lot, indicating teenage party happening here. <laughs> Now the parking lot is empty except for one truck. I'm on the road that leads to the river. The light is fading the trees from green to gray, and I realize I really have to take a piss. I think about all the student loans that I'll never be able to pay off, and I think about the texture of a parent's disappointment. I set my tote bag down and decide to squat off to the side of the road. My mom keeps calling. Where is this going? I wrote an email to the curator of this artist residency inquiring about going to their annual fundraising gala, not even realizing that it was in a completely different place or that Trump's former secretary of state was going to be one of the guest speakers. I'm in Buffalo, Wyoming. They're in Houston, Texas. That has the hospital that I was born in by C-section. What I'm doing is being paid for by an oil company. On the ride from the airport, the curator told me that we were on Crow, Cheyenne, and Lakota land. And then the residency was started by an oil tycoon who decided to name his company Apache. The Yakima River flows for 214 miles from the western side of what is referred to as Washington State until it flows, fans out across the high desert in the east side of the state. 
It's part of an intersecting river basin where the Columbia, the Snake, and the Yakima convene, and where indigenous people have gathered roots and hunt deer and fish salmon as they swim back home. Wikipedia will tell you that the Yakima River Delta is entirely a recreational area used for hiking and kayaking. However, when I was a teenager, I thought that the Yakima River Delta was primarily for teenagers tripping on acid while drinking wine coolers. <laughs> This was in part because there was a nondescript parking lot down the road from a place called the Hoedown, which is a place one could go and see rock music played by skinny, tattooed boys in dickies, who decided to move past pajama-y grunge into slicked-back hair and button-up shirts that held fast to their chain wallets. One of those slicked-back hair bands was called Small, and they had 15 seconds of MTV fame for a song they wrote in 1992 called Legalize It, Marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> they also wrote another song called Out at the Delta. The land around the river is covered in Russian olive trees, which are not native to the land and have this bark that doesn't break apart in chunks, but kind of flakes like thick pieces of paper mache. There was a day that I swam across the river, and it was earlier in the day than when I saw the dead cow floating in it. <laughs> I remember staring at that swollen body for a long time. I remember driving my dog to the vet with her body swollen like that because she was at the end of life and retaining water. She was in the passenger seat next to me, and my bike was in the back of the station wagon. As we were driving, a tire exploded, and it scared her. And to this day, I think that might have been her last straw. I moved away. One time, I came back and I had coffee with my friend Jessica at the all-night diner called Sherry's in Kennewick. And on the way home, we were driving through the parking lot of the mall where I had my first and my second job. Jessica actually worked at Hot Dog Mystic and wore the hat. But on this particular night, we were being followed by a truck that was flashing its lights and honking its horn at us. They pulled up next to us, and there was a woman with a baseball bat that was smacking it against her hand and calling us dykes. At first, we were confused, not quite scared. And then we thought, we should get the fuck out of here. And we tried to speed up, but the mall parking lot is full of speed bumps. <laughs> Jessica had a tiny Toyota hatchback, and that American truck that followed us almost all the way home definitely had bigger balls. I remember my dad talking to me about working with the Yakima Nations when he worked for the U.S. Department of Energy. He would talk about sitting in meetings with members of the nations where they were passing around a peace pipe. And I used to think, oh, my dad must be such a good guy to be in that room. But I don't know how it was. The U.S. Department of Energy took Yakima Nations land in order to build reactors to enrich plutonium, to make energy and weapons, including one of the atomic bombs that was used during World War II. The radioactive waste that was created as a byproduct was put into the ground in tanks that were supposed to last a long time, or at least until humans went extinct. But then within two decades, they were leaking. The Confederated Tribes of the Yakima Nations demanded that the U.S. government restore the land to how it was. And so there were some talks. And I think that they sent my dad in there to negotiate, because it comes across as genuinely kind and caring, but also a little bit simple. At Panera, my dad had just revealed to me that he'd been keeping a ledger recording all the wrong choices I had made since I was a teenager. <laughs> I have a spreadsheet, he said, without blinking. We can look at it when we get back to the house. And then I was on my knees, and then I got up off of them, and I booked a hotel room with a credit card. I thought about making a piece entitled, Hi, Dad, I'm a person, on behalf of all daughters, or on behalf of all artists, or all artists' daughters, or maybe just the non-doctors and non-lawyers, and 
the non-mothers, but also for the mothers. And then I realized, hi, Dad, I'm a person. Didn't need to be a piece. Just a sentence. The original idea was to replace the dance with a text, to choreograph her out of existence. Finally, a negative space dance. And finally, an inside joke for postmodern improvisational dancers. <laughs> All 20 of us. And then I thought, shit, I can still move, and I might not be able to for much longer, so why not? So I decided that I would learn as much as I could of a Trisha Brown piece from YouTube so that I could continue with the practice of embodying the thing that I'm supposed to be that I never have been, but it doesn't matter because enough people who might look like have embodied it before me, and then through a process of inclusion, inclusion and exclusion, it becomes something that I'm a part of, or at least in relation to. of dance. I find it quite beautiful, but also recognize a kind of familiar brutality inside of it. How much effort it takes to appear effortless, and how much rigor is applied to make something artificial seem natural. The other way that we can understand this dance 
is through its subtext, which is a list that reads body part, systems, small acts, me time, segues, home decorating, mammals, bird watching. I haven't actually gotten to the point where I do any bird watching for what Jenny O'Dell refers to as bird noticing, but I can at least understand it's a thing worth doing, which I used to not get at all. This is in part because birds, whether they are noticed or not, are important. And also what I've realized important is noticing in general. One summer, when my dad was better, I decided to give myself a dance history education by going to the Lincoln Arts Center, performing arts library, and watching everything I could think of from the few choreographers that I knew about. I watched Trisha Brown dancing around with a projector strapped to her back at Dance Theater Workshop. And then I watched her do her famous accumulation piece. I think they were actual VHS tapes. I watched the first dance film ever made that we know of by Norman McLaren on a flatbed projector in a special room where you had to close the door. And then I watched Deborah Hay, Merce Cunningham, Grand Union, Ralph Lohman, Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane, Meg Stewart, Van Van Cabus, Jerome Bell, Xavier Leroy, Neil Greenberg. And I remember thinking about how interesting it was. There were so many men I knew about in the archive, considering how relatively few there are in the field. Later, I went outside and I thought about how the New York City Ballet was rehearsing in the buildings nearby. And I felt like kind of a failure in some ways but also full of big city walking through an open plaza on the way to the subway kind of possibility. Like when you pick up rocks or shells on the beach and think about how nice it will be to have them on your windowsill. The potential of having something, that's not haveable. In 1855, the communities that today make up the Yakima nations were forced off of their land. In 1943, the US Department of Energy forced another evacuation of the Wanapam nation and ranchers and farmers in a specific region of southeastern Washington state that they had deemed uninhabitable and uninhabited. They leveled all of the structures in 586 square miles to create the Hanford Works Project a little sister to the Manhattan Project. In 1979, my dad moved from Texas to rural Washington to work on renewable energy and ended up on a nuclear waste cleanup site, smoking peace pipes with members of those communities. Later, when I moved there, I would sit and write poetry by a little irrigation ditch that I thought was a natural stream, and it very well may have been at one point the house that I grew up in would be behind me, about a mile away on an empty cul-de-sac. A split-level home that was covered in crocheted wall hangings my mom was slowly replaced with brass objects. She was a scientist. And if I had to guess, I would say that she wanted me to be an artist, scientist, feminist, pageant queen, supermodel genius, piano prodigy. <laughs> I had flat feet and was the kind of pale that really scared people in the 1980s and 90s. <laughs> there is an area of land around the Hanford Works Project that is referred to as a security buffer and also an involuntary park. In order to protect the reactors and provide free flowing water to cool the nuclear fuel rods, the river was left undammed, and the land was left undeveloped or touched by agriculture since 1943. And then in the year 2000, it was turned into a wildlife refuge and a national monument. The security buffer was there to provide a veil of secrecy, to protect the information or the technology or the intelligence, maybe even more so than the life the humans or the creatures that might come into contact with that life-threatening contamination. 
Then over the decades, the birds gathered. And now almost 50 endangered or threatened species have taken refuge there. And so, of course, I wonder, what has taken refuge in your involuntary part? <laughs>